After an officer was gunned down at point blank range, a psychotic killer led investigators across the Midwest. No one knew where the gunman would strike next, even as his tally of murders and abductions grew. The FBI and state police raced against time to rescue America's heartland from this deranged gunman. A small town without any crime was turned inside out by the arrival of one dangerous stranger. Some killers are cold and calculating. Others are impulsive, unpredictable, and hard to pin down. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. To flush out this killer required a SWAT team and a profiler who determined he would not surrender without a fight. At 8 a.m. on Monday morning, September 22, 1986, a U.S. parole officer made his way to the home of a parolee in a lower middle class neighborhood on the outskirts of Indianapolis, Indiana. It was a routine visit scheduled a week earlier. U.S. Probation Officer Thomas Gall needed to get a urine sample from an ex-convict to check for illicit drugs. Forty-year-old Michael Wayne Jackson had been released from federal prison five months earlier on weapons charges. He also had a history of substance abuse and severe paranoid schizophrenia. The parolee was reluctant to allow Gall to enter, but the officer insisted. No. Moments later, a neighbor heard shouting no. coming from Jackson's house. He saw the officer run out the door. Jackson followed him, firing a sawed-off shotgun into his back. The final shot was at point-blank range. Officer. The neighbor called police Officer. as he watched to see what Jackson might do next. He told the 911 operator that the ex-convict re-emerged, still carrying the shotgun. But now he was wearing a dark trench coat and heading for his green pickup truck. Indianapolis police raced to the killer's home, hoping to catch him before he got far. The neighbor added that Jackson also had on canvas sneakers and jeans as he watched Jackson leave the neighborhood. Jackson escaped before police could arrive. The police called in the FBI since the probation officer was a federal official. Thirty-nine-year-old Thomas Gall had been killed instantly from the shot to his head. FBI Special Agent Jack Osborne of the Indianapolis Field Office was assigned the case. When I arrived at the Jackson residence, the victim was still uh, at that uh, scene. We had dispatched uh, numerous agents and numerous police were in the area. Uh, we were in the process of identifying any witness we had so that they could be spoken to by the police department and also by an agent. The eyewitness who had called 911 described Jackson's behavior as having become increasingly erratic. At what time did you see the The neighbor said he had seen Jackson outside more than once talking to himself in a loud and agitated manner. Agents called the parole office to learn more about Jackson's background. 
While he was in prison the previous year, he had been diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic with antisocial personality and was uh, to uh, check in through the Indianapolis mental health facility and receive uh, monthly uh, medication for that illness and they were afraid that he was not taking his medication. Evidence technicians marked the positions of three 12-gauge shotgun shells found close to the parole officer's body. Thomas Gall had been shot three times, the last one proving fatal. On the job for 11 years, the Vietnam veteran was the first federal parole officer killed in the line of duty. Thomas Gall left a young family and many friends. I knew Tom pretty well. I knew his family, knew of his wife, knew that he had two kids, uh, knew that he had been in the Marine Corps, had spent a year in Vietnam. We had talked about that a little bit. He was uh, an extremely uh, likable person, uh, was extremely knowledgeable and caring, and it was hard working the case and keeping uh, distance uh, because of that closeness. The inside of Jackson's house was described by officers as unfit for human habitation. Amongst the refuse, searchers discovered the shirt spattered with blood that Jackson wore at the time of the shooting and had since stripped off. Trash and animal droppings were scattered everywhere. There was no electricity or running water. On a counter in the kitchen, investigators found a hacksaw. Mm -hmm. They also discovered a sawed-off stock and barrel of a shotgun, likely from the murder weapon Jackson was presumably still carrying. As investigators were processing the house, an alert came across the police radio. All right, we're on our way. Five miles away, witnesses had reported another homicide. Just 20 minutes after the parole officer was shot, a second man had been killed at a convenience store by a shotgun blast, and a third man had been abducted. Agents interviewed a witness who described the shooter as having bushy hair, a beard, and wearing a dark trench coat. The woman added that the killer was wearing a bizarre disguise. Witnesses at the JB Market indicate as a subject enters that market, he's carrying a shotgun, but he's got something on his face. Uh, the witnesses believe that it's grease uh, and probably some spray paint that uh, is in his hair and his beard, which really uh, was a strange look. Agents were convinced it was Jackson. The witness described that at 8.20 a.m., the armed man with a silver face burst inside demanding money. Don't anybody move! You! Get the hell out! You! Get back! You! Get behind there! Get the money out! Get the money! Come on, hurry up! Panicked, the owner struggled to open the register. Get the money! Get the money! But the gunman couldn't wait. Hey, fat boy, get out of here! Not wanting to leave empty-handed, the killer forced a bread delivery man to drive him from the scene in his bread truck. The witness didn't see which direction the bread truck was headed. Investigators revised the APB for Jackson to include the bread truck. Evidence technicians found a 12-gauge shell casing near the cash register the same gauge and make as those found at the first murder scene. Buckshot from the victim was later removed to compare to samples removed from the probation officer. Detectives examined the pickup truck Jackson left behind. Inside, they found grease and a can of silver spray paint that was likely the source of Jackson's makeshift disguise. We find that spray paint can in Jackson's truck uh, 
We're not sure why he sprays his face before he goes into the market after he had left his residence. We're surmising that he's trying to hide his identity uh, and he's doing that in this bizarre manner. 20 minutes later, agents received a call from the bread truck driver. Jackson had released him at the airport unharmed. But the man told investigators the fugitive was still armed and on the move. Jackson has uh, taken another vehicle from the airport, again at gunpoint, and he drove up through the Speedway, Indiana area, had failed to pay for $10.50 worth of gas at a Speedway Sunoco station, and he was in a vehicle that is described to us, and there was a female in that vehicle. Like the bread man, the woman was released shortly afterwards and called 911. But a second woman was not so lucky. At about 9 a.m., a young mother had returned to her suburban Indianapolis home following a shopping trip. As she unpacked her bags in the driveway, Michael Wayne Jackson emerged from a red pickup stolen at the airport. Hey! Get him. Get him. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get. Get. She was Jackson's third hostage in less than an hour. Jackson held her captive for over 60 minutes, driving with a shotgun in his lap. begged him to let her go, but he refused. There was no reasoning with the crazed fugitive. She asked him about the disguise on his face, why his face was, was smeared with grease and oil and had paint on it, and he had no explanation for her, but did tell her that if she didn't comply with what he was telling her to do, that he would kill her. The woman realized she had few options. The car slowed. She jumped out. Jackson drove over her ankle, but she managed to roll free before she was injured further. The mother of one was treated at a local hospital for a broken ankle, where she reported the incident. She had escaped her kidnapper in Frankfort, Indiana, 40 miles northwest of Indianapolis. Once again, agents revised their APB. It now included her sedan, last seen traveling north from Frankfort. Investigators struggled to predict Jackson's next move. They frantically gathered background information, trying to gain an edge. Mike Jackson had a very extensive criminal background. In 1985 in Indianapolis, he was arrested and charged federally uh, where he had homemade bomb devices in his vehicle and a homemade shotgun. Uh, for that, uh, he received one year sentence in federal prison and he was on three years parole for that uh, violation uh, during this time. Jackson had also been in and out of mental institutions much of his life. Over the strong objections of his family, psychiatrists had recently released him from a treatment center since his schizophrenia had been stabilized by medication. But without supervision, Jackson had probably stopped taking his prescriptions. And after two killings and three abductions in less than two hours, no one knew where Jackson was now. We were in the process of sorting this out, as well as trying to notify all local state emergency uh, people in the state of Indiana, as well as notifying other jurisdictions to help us try to locate Jackson. We knew what vehicle he last possessed in Frankfort, Indiana, and we hoped he was still in that vehicle and was not going to uh, uh, cause anyone else any harm anytime soon. But authorities would be too late. 
At 10.15 a.m., Jackson decided he needed to change cars again. He barged into the Frankfort, Indiana home of a mother and child. Don't move, kid! Get up! Jackson ordered the woman to get her car keys or he would kill her and her son. Get your purse! Get up, get up. Give me those keys. She complied. Give me those keys. Get! Move! Get your kid in the car! In less than two Hurry hours, up. Jackson had kidnapped his fourth and fifth victim. Get in the car! Go! Go! The killer was becoming bolder and more aggressive. Agents had to somehow find a way to catch him before his latest victims wound up dead. By 10.30 a.m. on September 22, 1986, 40-year-old Michael Wayne Jackson had murdered his parole officer and a grocery store clerk, then carjacked five other people, all in less than two and a half hours. The FBI and Indiana police believed the killer was traveling north from Indianapolis, but his exact whereabouts and destination remained unknown. Now, hurry up! Armed with a sawed-off shotgun and his face painted silver, Investigators believe Jackson was suffering from a psychotic episode after failing to take his medication. The fugitive was last seen in Frankfort, Indiana, where he had abducted a mother and child from their home. Jackson drove his latest victims to a desolate area eight miles from their home. Get, give me that ring. He get, stole the woman's wedding it. rings, get, then ordered them to the side of the road. Move it! Move it! Move it! Don't you go anywhere. Though the woman and her child survived unharmed, it was 20 minutes to the nearest phone before she could report the killer's last known whereabouts. At the FBI office in Indianapolis, three hours after Jackson's crime spree had begun, Special Agent Jack Osborne issued a federal murder warrant for the fugitive. But with so little information on his exact location, it would be difficult to prevent Jackson from striking again. Up northwest of Indianapolis at Frankfurt. That's our last spot. So we now had Jackson leaving or driving away from the Frankfort, Indiana area, but really had no idea where he was headed, how he was going to get there, what route he was going to take, or if he might uh, grab somebody else in the next uh, few hours. So this is our fifth location. Since Jackson's pattern of travel and crime was so random, Agents expanded the search and alerted all FBI field offices in a 750-mile radius, which included Cleveland, Chicago, and St. Louis. Let all of our offices know if we can get something out statewide, too, to all law enforcement agencies, uh, particularly along Interstate 65, maybe. They also contacted the fugitive's mother in Jackson, Mississippi, but she had no idea where her son might be headed. Investigators kept the media informed, too. By noon, Michael Wayne Jackson's photo was on every news program in the Indianapolis area. Six hours later, the fugitive surfaced close to St. Louis. He had traveled 300 miles southwest to nearby O'Fallon, Missouri. Local officers received reports from two residents who had been carjacked by a silver-faced man with a shotgun. A description of their car with Missouri plates was added to the list of stolen vehicles as Jackson's most recent. It's about a five-hour drive from Indianapolis to St. Louis. So in the early evening of Monday, the 22nd of September, local and state law enforcement in Missouri, after they had received our APBs, are notifying the police department and our office that they believed Jackson to be in that area because he had attempted 
uh, a kidnapping and a vehicle theft of a couple different people in that area. On a rural road later that afternoon, a third O'Fallon resident was on his way home from work when he spotted his wife's car with the suspect at the wheel. The man was unaware that Jackson had killed two others that same day. Hey! The silver-faced man with bushy hair and a beard refused to stop. As the cars approached an intersection, the killer drew his weapon. At 7 p.m. that evening, the man reported that the shooter only hit the front of his car. He'd returned home after the shooting to discover that his wife and father-in-law had been assaulted by the fugitive, but not seriously injured. Authorities now added the stolen blue sedan and its license plate to the APB for Jackson. It was the seventh vehicle carjacked in less than 12 hours. We were glad to hear, I think, that we knew where he was. Uh, we were glad to hear that he hadn't harmed anyone else uh, and that we knew now that uh, he had a different vehicle and that the St. Louis authorities, both federal, uh, local, and state, were in the process of trying to get him located and stopped without getting anyone else hurt. Yet despite the All Points Bulletin, Jackson was nowhere to be found. Missouri State Highway Patrol officers responded to an accident near I-70 in O'Fallon, close to where the fugitive was last seen. A car had careened into a tree. The driver was pronounced dead at the scene. Given the darkness of the night, officers could not determine the extent of the man's injuries. Suspicious of the circumstances, the man's family ordered an autopsy. The medical examiner determined that the man had been shot in the head at close range through the driver's window with a 12-gauge shotgun, the same type of weapon Jackson had used to kill his parole officer and a grocery store owner. Examiners sent the buckshot to the Indiana State Police Lab so it could be compared to the others. It would take several days to learn the results. Area patrols stepped up surveillance in search of the armed fugitive. Ten miles away at around 7.30 p.m., a dark sedan with Texas plates pulled into a Wentzville, Missouri gas station. Jackson had carjacked his eighth vehicle and took its driver hostage. The attendant was unaware of the manhunt and didn't know what to make of the man with the silver face. Ten dollars, please. When the fugitive paid for the gas, the attendant noticed a shotgun in his lap and blood on his hands. Thank you. He immediately notified authorities, who once again changed the APB for Jackson. It now included the sedan with Texas plates. State and local officers rushed to the Wentzville area near Interstate 70. They needed to find the spree killer before he struck again. On September 22, 1986, the FBI continued to hunt for fugitive Michael Wayne Jackson, wanted for murdering three and carjacking 11 others in less than 12 hours. The silver-faced Jackson was last spotted at a Missouri gas station armed with a sawed-off shotgun, driving a stolen dark sedan with Texas plates. Thank you. The passenger was the car's owner and was Jackson's latest hostage. It was impossible for authorities to know where Jackson might be headed, since his behavior had been so erratic after he stopped taking his antipsychotic medication. Wright City, Missouri police canvassed the interstate and local roads. At 9.15 p.m., 
Jackson was spotted alone in the stolen sedan by the town's police chief and his sergeant. Jackson seemed uncertain of what to do next. The chief radioed for reinforcements. They did not arrive in time. The sergeant was struck in the head. Jackson was long gone. The sergeant's injury was minor, so the chief gave chase, leaving him with a concerned witness. But the chief never caught up with the fugitive. Five miles away, a pair of Missouri State Highway Patrol officers sighted the stolen sedan, abandoned on an interstate median. No one was inside, but the keys were still there. Officers then heard banging from within the trunk. Watch out. They prepared for the worst. Help me there. Help. Take it easy. Right there. Hold. Push. Right there. Right. Hold. 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 Take it easy now. They found only the terrified owner, traumatized but unhurt. His identification had been stolen, so police checked to be sure he was unarmed. He described his silver-faced kidnap, armed with a sawed-off shotgun. He had no idea where the man had fled, but it appeared he had taken his gun since police did not find it in the car. The FBI and local police fanned out, not knowing which direction the fugitive had run, or if he had already carjacked his next victim. Despite hours of searching, they turned up no sign of the gunman, according to special agent in charge of the FBI in St. Louis, Hal Helteroff. The night that Michael Wayne Jackson had abandoned his vehicle, uh, we had the two sweeps uh, on, the no on the south side of the interstate and the north side of the interstate the next morning. Uh, we were unable to flush him out of there. Uh, then uh, I determined that this was going to be a longer manhunt than I had expected. And at that point, uh, I uh, ordered in more FBI agents. State and federal agents examined Jackson's last stolen vehicle. They noted the driver's side door had been pierced during the shootout with police. Since they did not find the slug, it appeared likely that Jackson had been hit in the ribs. The fact that Jackson fled the vehicle moments later could account for the lack of blood on the seat. One theory was that he was injured and maybe went south of the interstate and laid down somewhere and, and either couldn't get up due to uh, being injured or, or died. A central command post was established in Wright City to coordinate the search efforts. And, uh, the vehicle that was taken there was recovered in O'Fallon, Missouri. The area and around the interstate war, encompassed thousands of acres of farmland and woods. To contain it would require hundreds of personnel, vehicles, and 24-hour roadblocks. For Missouri State Patrol Sergeant Don Bazelli, no one would be safe until Jackson was found. Okay. The information that we obtained from the Bureau about the uh, background on Jackson made us more concerned for the safety um, of the uh, citizens in Wright City and for the safety of our officers. He hadn't hesitated to shoot before, and he had already killed a law enforcement officer, the probation officer, and uh, there was nothing to let us to believe that he'd stop. Great. Have some information you'll need on that. Authorities established a perimeter around Wright City, extending five miles in every direction. Residents in the town of 1200 awoke to find their community saturated with law enforcement, searching for an armed and unstable killer. With a homicide rate of zero and little criminal activity of any kind, citizens were frightened were forced to lock their doors for the first time, and many kept their children home from school. 
we had to start alerting the community that we had a suspect in the area that uh, was very dangerous and asked the uh, people to uh, keep us informed if they saw anybody matching uh, Jackson's description. And uh, it didn't take long for the word to get around, of course, in that small community, because our greatest fear was that he would uh, take someone hostage. The sprawling countryside was divided into mile-wide sectors. Search teams consisted of bloodhounds, SWAT members, FBI agents, and state police. Photos were distributed to searchers, and samples of Jackson's clothing were provided to the dogs to learn the killer's scent. Hundreds of occupied and abandoned buildings dotted the landscape. All would have to be searched. Over the next several days, many locations were explored more than once. It was a tedious and time-consuming process. Bloodhounds, known for their large jowls and long ears, which stir minute scents towards their perceptive noses, found few signs of Jackson. At one building, searchers came across an abandoned campsite. But it appeared the cookware and old raincoat had been left behind by an itinerant laborer during the harvest season. Despite a week of searching, the teams found no evidence of Jackson's whereabouts. We tried not to get frustrated. We tried to keep the morale up, saying today's the day, we're going to find him. Uh, it's, uh, it's the type of case that uh, your troops are out there and they expect any minute that they're going to get a sighting on him. So, so that in itself just keeps you going. Media did their part to keep the public informed. While the FBI and right. State Highway Patrol maintained 24-hour checkpoints on the 27 miles of roadways into and out of the Wright City area, they stopped each car that came through. One of the men they stopped claimed to be the fugitive's nephew. He said he had heard about the search and he wanted to help. He told them his uncle could survive on his own in the woods and that it was possible that Jackson could be wearing body armor since he owned some. This might explain how Jackson survived a policeman's bullet that had likely hit his ribs. We determined that uh, from the use of dogs, we had tracking dogs and we had uh, cadaver dogs come in, uh, that we could not come up with a dead body. Therefore, uh, I was leaning toward the fact that he was still alive and well. Area farmers tried to maintain some semblance of normalcy, though remaining vigilant. A week into the manhunt, one woman spotted the bearded fugitive in his dark trench coat carrying a shotgun. She called police immediately, but the man disappeared before authorities arrived. Seven days after Michael Wayne Jackson had fled his Indiana home, the spree killer was still on the loose. The FBI knew that they had to find him before he found another victim. By September 28, 1986, a week had passed in the hunt for armed fugitive Michael Wayne Jackson, wanted for multiple murders, carjackings, and the wounding of a police officer. The 41-year-old criminal was last seen armed and on foot in the rural area of Wright City, Missouri. Despite a massive search, the FBI and local investigators had found no signs of the killer's whereabouts. The FBI considered the possibility that Jackson had stolen another car and somehow escaped the area. Um, I'm need Desperate, they turned to FBI senior investigative profiler Ron Walker for help. What they were simply asking for was uh, my estimate, my uh, predict prediction, I guess, of what he was going to do, what his continued acts were going to be, uh, and where he was likely to go. And, and really more importantly for them at this period of time uh, was, um, is he still in the area that they had been searching for seven days? 
Agent Walker analyzed Jackson's criminal and psychological history, as well as the reports from his current rampage. Since there were no new crimes recorded in the past week, the profiler concluded that Jackson had not yet left Wright City, Missouri. Well, my opinion was that he was there, that uh, he had probably become disoriented because of his paranoid kind of beliefs, uh, his fear of being captured, he would avoid contact with people uh, unless it would be to gain access to a vehicle to get out. Uh, and for that reason, I told him it was very important to maintain a very high profile, a high level of obvious police activity, because you don't want him to have the opportunity to think that he can get away out by carjacking someone and getting a car and, and driving out of the area. Since the fugitive was likely still in the area, the FBI called on the experience of tracker Bob Swabe from the Knoxville, Tennessee FBI field office. Swabe is best known for finding Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassin, James Earl Ray, after Ray's escape from a Tennessee prison in 1976. Agents hoped the renowned tracker could locate Jackson based on the minute signs he was trained to read. Very seldom will you find a good footprint. You've got to learn to interpret the disturbance that's on the ground. And uh, the little unusual thing, like a leaf that is turned over or a stick that is uh, uh, just a small limb that has uh, been stepped on and crushed or broken. From decades of experience, Swabe can discern the difference between animal and human tracks through the depth of their imprint, the height at which branches of grass are disturbed around them, and their surface temperature. While animals often leave traces of their body heat after resting, humans' body heat is mostly absorbed by their clothing or shoes, preventing their heat from escaping. But since the hunt for Jackson had been so extensive, picking up his trail presented some unique challenges, even for the experienced tracker. There were, had been so many people in there prior to us arriving on the scene. I mean, you know, that had, uh, that had um, I guess, probably two or 300 uh, police officers, law enforcement officers in this whole area searching before we ever arrived on the scene. So it made it more difficult. Then, on September 29th, 1986, a Wright City resident confirmed what the profiler had suspected. He reported that his guest house had been broken into. Nothing had been stolen, but he did find a broken mirror used disposable razors, and an open can of soup. From the bathroom sink, evidence technicians recovered shaved hair flecked with silver paint. It appeared that Jackson had once again changed his appearance. After nine days of searching, agents feared Jackson may have slipped past patrols with his new appearance. Special Agent Jack Osborne took steps to alert the public at large. Jackson was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list on October 1st, so we could get some national exposure. Uh, manhunt in St. Louis and the Wright City area had continued for numerous days. There were sightings, but we still didn't know for sure where he was, and we thought that added publicity with him being such a dangerous person is what would help get him located if he had left that St. Louis Wright City area. On October 2nd, investigators returned to a building they had searched a week earlier. Camping gear that searchers had previously noticed was still there, but one item was now missing, a blue raincoat. They wondered if it was Jackson's and whether he had returned to claim it now that the nights were getting colder. I felt that he was probably going to look for uh, some abandoned outbuilding to hide in, just get out of the weather. Uh, he, you're dealing with a guy here who has uh, who's been on the run, no food or water that we know of to speak of, um, high strength of, of emotional and psychological anxiety and arousal. Physically, he would have been very, very debilitated, and mentally as well. As the team approached a nearby barn they had searched before, a tracker noticed a muddy sneaker print leading inside. Jackson was last seen wearing sneakers. 
Searchers were not sure how old the print was, or even if it was Jackson's. We knew that there had been SWAT teams there, and uh, we didn't know really for sure whether that was his track or uh, one of our own tracks. Part of the mud had dried up a little bit, part of it was still wet, indicating that it was uh, probably uh, maybe eight hours old. A single gunshot rang out from the hayloft. One team member escaped unharmed, but another was trapped below. When the shotgun went off above my head, of course, there was, uh, there was buckshot flying all over that barn. I don't, I don't think any of us got hit by it, but uh, um, I looked to my left and I saw one of the trackers jump into the stable. Without knowing the gunman's exact location, he couldn't make his way to the door without exposing himself as a target. Yeah. Yeah. Since the tracker had no radio, searchers spoke to him okay, through the good. walls. Okay, good. He confirmed he had not been hit and described the interior layout so the team could plan a rescue. There was no way out except through the front door. I saw the outcome in the Jackson case as being a violent one. Uh, I saw this going to either a, uh, a barricade situation with a shootout where he is ultimately killed by the police, possibly a suicide by police where uh, he forces the police to shoot him. I felt completely uh, confident that there would not be a, a peaceful resolution to this. The tracker waited for help, trapped inside the barn, with an armed and demented gunman perched above him. On October 2nd, 1986, the FBI and Missouri State Police surrounded a barn in Wright City where a tracker was trapped by a gunman in the hayloft believed to be murderer Michael Wayne Jackson. As a chopper surveilled the barn from above, SWAT members took positions around the perimeter. The sharpshooter provided cover fire, hoping to distract the gunman long enough for the tracker to escape through the front door. Although the tracker had been inside for several hours following the single shotgun blast from the loft, he never saw nor heard the shooter after that. FBI Special Agent in Charge Hal Helterhoff was left with some tough decisions as he managed the standoff. We didn't want to send in our troops uh, if, there was an, if he had planned an ambush, if he had just shot uh, as a decoy if he was still in there alive and well, but still loaded with rounds of shotgun shells, we just didn't know what we had. The barn's owner provided yeah, agents with a detailed with sketch of the interior. The farmer explained that there was tractor storage and some stalls on the bottom floor with a hayloft above. There was a window in the loft, but no other escape routes, no hidden trenches or trap doors through which the suspect might have slipped out. This is all four here, and I got a whole bunch of hay over here. Michael Wayne Jackson. Agents attempted to make contact with the fugitive. Come out, your hand on your head, and you will not be hurt. They received no answer. And after working so hard all those days, we didn't want to make an incorrect move and have one of our agents or officers or troopers injured at the last minute when it was unnecessary. So it was a very, very disciplined, well-organized effort. The special agent in charge hoped tear gas would flush the shooter out. They fired non-flammable tear gas canisters into the loft. There was still no movement. It's so dark and, and we were trying to determine 
Should we have our, our tactical move, our assault? Should we wait till the next morning or wait till dawn where it's daylight? Again, uh, we went 11 days. What's a few more hours when we know whoever's in there is trapped? And we had a weather advisement that a violent storm was going to be moving in around midnight. So the state police and I decided, let's go now. Equipped with night vision goggles, SWAT members navigated the dark, shadowy space. A pair of agents provided cover while their partners searched the lower level. They found no one on the first floor. They had no way to know if the killer was lying in wait, or if he was still there at all. Hey guys, I got a body over here. They had their answer soon enough. Lying amongst the hay bales, they found a man holding a shotgun who appeared to be Jackson. Is it him? He was dead, killed by the single shot he had fired hours earlier into his own head. Agents needed to confirm his identity. I said, let's take his fingerprints, and we had an FBI agent, expert fingerprint examiner, uh, on the scene with the known prints of Michael Wayne Jackson, and uh, he uh, took his fingerprints, and uh, and then we waited uh, while he did his assessment, and finally he announced that it's definitely a match, it's Michael Wayne Jackson, and then at that point we were all relieved. They found no body armor on the killer. But as the FBI profiler had predicted, Michael Wayne Jackson chose to die rather than give himself up. Eleven days after Michael Wayne Jackson killed his parole officer and began his crime spree, the town of Wright City, Missouri was able to feel safe again. It could have ended much worse, according to Missouri State Patrol Sergeant Don Bazelli. I was relieved for the people that no one else was going to get hurt. That was my main concern. No one else in that community would have to worry about Michael Wayne Jackson anymore. Through the sacrifice of Thomas Gall, probation officers now have the option of carrying protective sidearms. FBI Special Agent Jack Osborne was close to Gall and his family and continues to mourn the loss. As a uh, law enforcement officer, I think a little bit of you dies when people close to you suffer. Tom was close to me personally. Uh, Tom was a friend. He was not only a friend to me personally, but he was a friend to our office. Our office knew him, uh, and we worked very closely with him in the Federal Probation Parole Office. For giving up his life in the line of duty, the Indianapolis U.S. Probation Office was renamed in Thomas Gall's memory. It enabled his friends and colleagues to express in a more permanent way Goal's significant contributions, his exemplary character, and the agency's deep and lasting affection for him. <laughs>